Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, welcome back to Mino Marco and me on Monday about energy in Hawaii here on ThinkTech. And we are delighted to have on the phone um, both of them, uh, Mino Marino, former chair of the PUC, and now uh, the manager or the proprietor of Energy Dynamics, which is an energy consulting and blog, uh, and um, uh, Marco Mangelsdorf, who is the president of ProVision Solar and a longtime energy man in Hawaii and the Big Island. So, and who writes and um, sends us uh, articles and whatnot, he's everywhere. Marco, you sent an article this morning from the Wall Street Journal uh, about new, new dimensions in solar and, um, solar and PV combinations in multiple cities around the mainland. And one would think from that article that it's going gangbusters. What's happening? Well, first, I want to just say how pleased I am to be back on with my two uh, Amigo and Amigas. Uh, I think it's the first time in six or six or eight weeks that the three of us have been on together. So it's uh, great to get the uh, the terrific uh, tri triad uh, back together again. <laughs> so thanks again for having me and having uh, being back with you as well, Mina. Thank you, yeah, thank I, you Marco. Thank you, Mina. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's uh, interesting to see what kind of the main uh, uh, mainstream media. I don't know to what extent people would consider the Wall Street Journal the mainstream mainstream uh, media. I mean, I happen to think just uh, a brief editorial comment that their reporting is actually very, very, very solid uh, as far as their op-ed with Rupert Murdoch. I mean, that's that's a different <laughs> whole different story. But I, I have a lot of respect for quite a few of their reporters. And Russell Gold is one of their energy reporters. He writes out of Texas and. His piece today in the journal is looking at uh, utility-scale storage and how in certain parts of the country there's substantial money going into uh, deploying uh, multi-megawatt-hour batteries, uh, uh, you know, as high as 100 megawatt hours worth of storage, which is not uh, not chump change in terms of energy storage. And there's a big project going in in Arizona that's developed by our friends at Next Air Energy in Florida, the uh, one-time suitor of Hawaiian Electric Industries uh, mm -hmm. a couple, three years ago. Yeah. And one of the most, I uh, think, important takeaways, uh, according to the piece, is that if you can have battery storage, uh, to take care of uh, meeting the peak demand that the utility experiences at a certain time of the day, typically afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the U.S., uh, it's making more and more sense to rather than run so-called peaker plants or ramping up fossil fuel generation to meet demand, instead doing it with storage. And if the storage can be store charged up by renewables, which uh, at least with solar, you know, sun don't shine except during the day. So if you could have uh, utility-scale storage that's charged by renewables that's able to take the place of peaker plants in more and more service territories, that's uh, that's a good thing. So And it's getting cheaper and cheaper to do so because I mean, utility companies and companies like Nextera uh, are careful with their investments, careful with their money, and they don't go for things like this unless they think it makes sense economically. So it's uh, it's great movement uh, in the right direction, I think. Yeah, well, it was really interesting that uh, Nextera should be the one doing this uh, we were, or some people here were concerned uh, in, the, in the approval process that they would not focus um, on, on uh, photovoltaic and renewables enough. Well, clearly they're focusing on it in two, in two significant cities and two significant projects right now. The other thing I get out of this is that, uh, you're right, a peaking plant is very expensive because it has to ramp up and ramp down right away. And uh, the, the numbers that were cited in the uh, Wall Street Journal article was that for an hour, um, what is it, a, a megawatt hour or kilowatt hour, 87, what is it, 87 cents per kilowatt hour on a peaking plant. Now, now that, that wouldn't be the result all month, but during the hours of peaking, 87 cents for a kilowatt hour. And, and for batteries, it was 36 cents. So it's less than half um, the cost during the, you know, the peaking plant time of, of the clock. Which is really saying something about the future for why, and we have, and we have a peaking plant at Kapolei. I'm sure that it falls right in, you know, in, in that same uh, comparison. So, um, you know, what do you think? I mean, uh, have we done enough on batteries in Hawaii? What what do we need to do to follow this apparent trend that is being described in the Wall Street Journal article? Well, 
I, I you know, I, again, you have um, Kauai as the leader in this with um, dispatchable solar and storage um, power purchase agreement already negotiated and, you know, one, one plant operating and the other one is um, being built. Um, you know, I see batteries as a, or storage in general as an important um, component to moving to larger penetrations of um, variable renewables onto the system. And, uh, but I mean, it shouldn't be looked at a panacea. This is a really, really good direction. And one of the things that we should um, note here is, you know, the amount of ancillary services um, um, batteries can provide that um, you know, like uh, regulation and voltage control um, to keep, keep the grid stable. I mean, you know, that that's really important, especially when you're dealing with so much variability. And and so it's, it's a good direction. And um, I think we need to get people to look, again, instead of um, storage from just a distributed energy resource to also store it as an important utility resource that um, has uh, a larger impact on grid stability. Now, that raises an interesting question. I mean, uh, that is, you know, um, we have a lot of residences out there, smaller installations, where there are batteries right now. A lot of people have done that. You know, a lot of a lot of money has been invested by individual homeowners into storage and PV, um, you know, combinations. Is it right. better? Is from a from a community point of view, a state point of view, is it better to put that investment on individual facilities, on individual single-family residences, or for that matter, on community solar, or should we rather put it at the utility level, where you have much bigger numbers? I, you know, for me personally, I'd rather see it at the utility need, um, on the utility side mm -hmm. because you do reach greater numbers of people that way. And, um, you know, while distributed energy is a good resource, I, we have to look, be looking at these bigger issues on um, on such as grid modernization to get a larger impact um, system-wide. Um, rather, you know, it's going to happen on both ends. Mm -hmm. But if you're using ratepayer resources and taxpayer resources, to me, it has to go where there's the largest public benefit, and that is on the utility side. Marco, how do you feel about that? That's a great segue into something I wanted to mention, guys, which is that uh, not being a lawyer, nor being a tax accountant, uh, with those caveats uh, in front, there is a case to be made, and I can guarantee you there's a fair amount of four, five, four, six hundred dollar lawyers that are looking at this in great detail. <laughs> case to be made that under the current IRS language for the renewable energy tax credit, the, or I should say the investment tax credit, 30% investment tax credit, which is 30% this year, 30% next year, 2019, before it starts ramping down to 2020, 21, 22, there is a case to be made that adding storage, adding energy storage to a facility that the storage is charged 75 or more percent by solar, that that particular investment of adding storage, as long as it is charged by a majority, uh, 75 or more percent, coming from renewable energy, can qualify for the ITC. So we're talking a substantial incentive here, obviously, right? If you, can, if you as an investor can install a 20 megawatt hour, 100 megawatt hour battery, and you can have high confidence based on a comfort letter ruling or something uh, akin to that from the IRS, that your investment will qualify for 30% federal tax credit as long as it's charged majority-wise by solar or renewable energy, that is, uh, and I don't, 
really like to use the phrase game changer because it's so incredibly overused, but that would be a very, very big deal in the deployment of energy storage, both on the utility side of the meter and also on the customer side of the meter. Yeah, yeah. Well, how does this impact the bill, which I believe is introduced already, uh, to, um, I guess, to link or add uh, battery investment, you know, with a state tax credit to solar? Where, where is that, and what, is, what effect does that have on this issue? I spoke briefly to Chris Lee last week, chair of the uh, House Energy and Environment Committee, the, the uh, committee that Amina was a long, long time chair of back in her days in the legislature. And there is a bill uh, in play right now. It's on the Senate side uh, that was introduced, I believe, by Senator Lorraine Inouye here on this island and co-sponsored by others that would establish a state tax credit for the addition of energy storage uh, at a 30 percent, starting at 30 percent state tax credit. Uh, that will have to uh, survive a uh, Senate floor vote before, what is it, I think, the first decking, which is, means that it would transfer over to the House for the House consideration, and then the House would consider it, make changes, uh, certainly, and then uh, it would go to conference at the end of the session, as it did in 2017, as it did in 2016. So we can only hope, at least those of us in the industry, can only hope that um, maybe the third time would be a charm that a uh, state tax credit for storage would get out of conference uh, in May, in early May, and make it to the governor's desk. Now, again, it brings up the question of uh, is taxpayer money and is a further hit on the general fund in light of other priorities that the state has, from homelessness to taking better care of our kupuna to on down the line of priorities, is it uh, reasonable to uh, subsidize this uh, type of purchase, whether it's commercial or residential industrial utility scale, with taxpayer dollars. And I'll just remind both of you that the largest tax credit, the largest hit on the state's general fund over the past years has been by far, by far, by far the state renewable energy tax credit to the tune of about half a billion dollars for the three years that we have the most recent records for, which is 20, 2014, 2015, and 2016. No, excuse me, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2013, 2014, 2015, we have the most recent records in terms of DOTAX, and uh, there was approximately half a billion dollars claimed uh, for the renewable energy tax credit. So does it make sense to subsidize through state incentives having uh, taxpayer dollars subsidize storage? Yeah. Well, let me, let me add a thought uh, before going to Mina on this. The thought is that if you have a federal tax credit of 30% for this kind of installation, and then you add a tax credit of 30% on the state level, that's a 60% credit. And, you know, we want, we want these credits to incentivize. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I, I, don't think, I don't think that's the correct statement. I think you have to deduct the tax credit and the federal credit before you can take the state credit. Okay, okay. Nevertheless, uh, you know, it's two credits, and the question I put to you is, and that's an interesting question, is you, these credits are all about incentivizing behavior or de-incentivizing it. And do we need both levels of credit to incentivize the, to the extent we need to incentivize, you know, to move the needle ahead on renewable energy and, and, and for that matter, batteries? Do we need that much, okay. Mina? Quite frankly, I... I I don't support a separate tax credit for energy storage. I, I think if you design the system correctly, you can take the renewable energy tax credit, uh, which includes the, the um, in, entire system. And, and so I'd like to move more in that direction than a separate tax credit because, you know, a lot of people who put solar panels on, on their roofs have benefited greatly from public funds. And to me, a separate um, storage tax credit is really a double dip. Um, you know, they, they already, um, a lot of people already have great advantages from net meter system. Taking the tax credit, really fa favorable payback period. Um, so to come back with another tax credit, I find that, quite frankly, hard to sum up. Okay, hey, it's very Thank interesting. So we're we're going to take a, a single dip, actually, now, Mina and Marco. We're going to take the dip of a one-minute break. We'll be back right after that, and we can talk about what's happening on Molokai and with 
grid modernization and demand response, all the issues that are popping up these days. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha, I'm Winston Welch, and every other Monday at 3 p.m., you can join me at Out and About, a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. So please join us every other Monday at 3, and we'll see you then. Aloha. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Okay, we're back with Mina Marco and me on Monday about energy in Hawaii here on Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and we have uh, Mina Morita and Marco Mangelsdorf on the phone to talk about developments in energy. And Marco, you had some comments on what Mina was talking about in terms of the um, the, uh, the the policy around uh, giving credits um, to s solar battery installations. Yes, I, I definitely understand and appreciate Mina's perspective on this. And I just wanted to not so much counter what she said, but add to it in the sense that there is a reasonable argument that can be made that adding storage on both sides of the meter provides a level of greater resiliency and redundancy to our vulnerable island grid. And I think especially in light of what we continue to witness as the uh, pain and suffering of the folks in Puerto Rico, who now five months after Hurricane Maria, there's still upwards of 40-ish percent of residents who do not have reliable electricity getting clobbered so badly by that hurricane, that there is a societal benefit, there is a communal benefit to subsidizing the deployment of more and more energy storage on both the customer side of the meter and also on the utility side of the meter. Uh, and I've talked to my Hawaiian Electric friends from time to time about this in terms of when did they foresee that we will reach a point of a smarter grid that will be more interactive, more interdependent, and more resilient that's able to take advantage of the greater deployment of energy storage. And they don't have a definitive answer because the reality, of course, is there's no such thing as a definitive answer to that question it's speculative <laughs> in terms of the timing. But it is, an important, it is an important thing to strive for as these isolated island grids that we have, that we are on a hurricane track here. We have very long supply lines. And if batteries can add to the stability, resilience, and redundancy, protection of our grids, and it's something that is worth supporting yeah. with taxpayer dollars. I, I sure agree with the idea it, of watching, studying Puerto Rico, what happened there. Uh, there was a program a couple of weeks ago with the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center that brought in people from Puerto Rico, also from the Virgin Islands, um, to talk about, you know, the resilience of their grids and what they would do differently. It was very interesting. And I, my own view is that we need to study Puerto Rico because otherwise— it could very well become the ghost of Christmas future uh, for Hawaii. Hey, Mina, you wanted to say something. Yeah, it, it's not that I disagree uh, with, with Marco. I just think that with public money, with rate payer money, we have to be more targeted in our approach to where the public gets the greatest benefit and also help reduction in cost. Um, you know, to, to, to subsidize an individual that has the ability and makes the choice to move in this direction is very different from subsidizing, um, you know, a public facility that might have, that might need the resiliency and has a bigger effect on the community, um, um, especially during um, a, uh, a disaster type situation. 
So it's, we have a limited pot of money, public money, rate care money. We need to make really good decisions on how we extend those kinds of um, uh, resources for the greater public good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let me uh, let me go to another solar issue, and that is the uh, ultimate uh, agreement reached uh, on the Half Moon Project in Molokai. You've been following that closely, Marco. What what happened there? Well, this is a, uh, at least for now, a successful um, milestone uh, conclusion. Well, not really conclusion, but a conclusion in the long-going dis- discussions and negotiations between Maui Electric, uh, HECO, and this firm based in Chicago called Half Moon Ventures. And Half Moon, we had uh, their president, Michael Hastings, on our show a number of months ago. Mm-hmm. You might remember that. Uh, I do. Jay, and they have developed a number of projects around the, the mainland U.S. and also in this state, and they have pitched to to Miko for the past, gosh, it's going on two years, I think, a, a large PV plus storage uh, at the uh, adjacent to the one and only one uh, Miko power plant on Molokai. And this would be a 7.5 megawatt solar array, which is uh, fairly big, especially for that island, with a 15, 15, 15 megawatt hour battery. So the clock has been ticking in terms of getting this underway so that the tax credits, full tax credits, can be uh, applied for, which means that the system would have to be up and running essentially by the end of next year, the end of 2019. Mm-hmm. So it, it's really a pretty big deal. The next step is that the parties will open a docket, uh, file for opening a docket with the Public Utilities Commission. I expect that to happen within the next 30 or so days. Uh, Mina can probably answer much better than I could in terms of with a power purchase agreement that's being proposed by the parties, in this case, this new entity called, uh, let's, I'm just going to look at the Molokai New Energy Partners, mm-hmm. Half Moon Ventures, Molokai New Energy Partners, and MECO and HECO. Uh, the consumer advocate will be an intervener, but uh, to what extent will uh, Randy Wasse, Lorraine, or Kiba, and Jay Griffin uh, have it be wider open, Have the, uh, in other words, accepting interveners? or uh, participants on a broader scale. And, of course, the more people you bring into the party, the more they're going to want their say, the longer things are going to drag on. And I think, practically speaking, uh, new uh, Molokai New Energy Partners needs a uh, go, no, go by the commission. Uh, I'm going to say, you know, by, by fall or late next year at the latest in order to, for them to be able to do what they need to do in terms of pull the trigger on it, logistic challenges and so forth and so on, permitting. You mean late so, this uh, year, don't you? You mean late this year? This uh, is going to take them a year to build it, no? Uh, yeah, and having worked myself on and off on Molokai for over 10 years, uh, I know what a, the challenge can be over there in terms of trying to pull things off. It's just you can't just hop down into your van and go to Home Depot and get whatever electrical stuff you need. It has to be flown in, and it's really a big, big challenge logistically to to, to do projects over there. So, it, it's it's the first big step here, and I was really pleased that. Miko and uh, the Chicago company were able to pull this off, and that and Hiko. I mean, because Hiko obviously is the, uh, the parent company of Miko, and they had to give their assent. So uh, this is really cutting uh, cutting new ground, or will be breaking new ground, uh, especially for an island that uh, is uh, just one power plant, a limited number of customers, about 3,000 utility customers, and if it goes live, as, uh, as I hope it does, it'll be great for renewables, and it's. Uh, it's proposed that it's going to be about 17, 17 cents per kilowatt hour, which is uh, considerably less than uh, the, the present yeah, cost that, or little little future cost. That would really improve generation. things on Molokai. So, Mina, what do you think? Uh, what does this mean? And uh, is it possible to get it through the PUC on time? Well, I think, you know, um, there is, I, I'm not familiar with this um, proposal, but I, I think some of the things to be looking at is, did it go out for a competitive bid? Um, no, it did not. Yeah, so you know they would have to come out and they would have to make the business case for it. And you know, seventeen cents compared to what they're paying right now looks like a real bargain. So hopefully, I I I, I wish there was a faster way to process um, because you don't want um, you know there's a lot of opportunity lost here um, the, the longer it sits out there. I mean, uh, but if I could ask you, Mina, 
Do you have any sense for a power purchase agreement like this, as it's been proposed, between a private party and a utility company, in this case MECO, that MECO determined is uh, under uh, no bid, and that, in other words, you don't have to go mm-hmm. for, for open bidding process, what the procedure would be in terms of the commission deciding who or who would not be accepted as possible interveners? Um. You know, I, I I don't know what the um, what standard is being used right now, but for somebody to intervene and delay the process, especially when you're looking at much lower costs, you know, you you, you hope the the um, commission will consider again the opportunity cost in in um um not moving ahead quickly. Yeah, well, one thing that strikes me is, that I agree certainly, Marco, the more interveners you have, the longer it takes, but in a, in a case like this where it would significantly reduce the cost, I mean, to a really acceptable level, relatively speaking, in Molokai, um, would, you know, you, you, you worry not so much about interveners in general, but about interveners who would delay things, interveners who would object, uh, you know, and try to and try to slow the project down or stop it. So the question is, right. the question I put to you, I mean, all that we know about this, even including the fact that there, there were no competitive bids, which, you know, I'm, I'm not sure we really need them here in this case. Um, do you think anybody would come in and intervene and oppose this project, knowing what we know? You, there's always that posture, too. <laughs> I, I, I guess but, I'd have to accept that. <laughs> you, you know, the, the the other thing that I think that's kind of important with this um, project, too, is um, ancillary services. You know, so you're looking at a really small system on Molokai, and, you know, right now they're dependent on, what, two diesel generators? that they really can't turn off and, and uh, 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 you know, a period during the day where they've got too much solar and no demand. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think, you know, um, having this system come on is really important to um, ancillary services on the island. Yeah. And it makes a good case, I think, for the uh, adding to the resili- resiliency of the grid there, because like you mentioned, Mina, I mean, they have as many, if I'm not mistaken, as 10, they have 10 generators at that plant that they rotate, and two of them have to be on, minimum of two of them have to be on at any given time, because they can't just have one on if one goes down, the whole island goes dark. So they have two generators on, and the generators are obviously using fossil fuel of some kind, and if you can offset the runtime of fossil fuel generators with solar and batteries, I mean, that's, and do it cost effectively, and in this case, What's the risk on the part of the ratepayers? What's the risk on the part of MECO? They've got this PPA nailed down, assuming it meets regulatory approval, scrutiny and approval, then uh, the, their risk is fairly minimal. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hopefully going to be a win-win for them all concerned. But you know, as I've known uh, or determined in the 18 years I've been in this game here, these past years, that uh, it's really one day at a time. And uh, you know, there's no doubt that... Uh, uh, that the HEI board and the next year board had a high degree of confidence that they were going to be successful, right? Otherwise, why do it? And it turned out that after hundreds of millions of dollars were spent and break breakup fees, that uh, they weren't ultimately successful in getting regulatory approval. So uh, I'm hopeful, of course, that it's going to you know it's going to work because it's the well. One, one you know, factor we haven't project. talked about is uh, is sustainable Molokai, which is a, I'm going to call it an activist organization in Molokai. And then one of the co-managers of that is a woman named Amelia Nordhook, who uh, we, we spoke to when we visited uh, at Molokai a couple months ago. And uh, she was talking about expectations by that group of having a piece of the action, uh, either in a percentage of ownership or in a percentage of, um, you know, of the gross. And um, you know, I wonder where that fits, uh, you know, to the extent that they're there and they have expectations uh, they may get involved in the procedure, the, you know, the procedure of approval too. Do you have any idea, Marco, about what what they might be expecting these days? 
I would think that, uh, let me answer this way, I would think that if any organization had a chance of becoming an intervener, assuming they were willing to pull the trigger on that, hire legal counsel, or if you're in the case of somebody like Henry Curtis, you do it yourself for the most part. But it's not a, a, a trivial thing to do to go for intervener status and become an active intervener and on, on a docket. It's, it's not trivial. It can be rather expensive in case, uh, in fact, depending on the particular docket. So to what extent uh, Sustainable Molokai would have the oomph, have the individuals, have the money to be able to, to be uh, truly a, sit, a seat at the table rather than just be, uh, uh, seating at a conference table when a presentation is given, which is what they have done in the past, I really don't know. I don't get the feeling that Sustainable Molokai is backed by Boku Bucks anywhere. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's great. I'm not dissing them by any stretch, but uh, being kind of a grassroots organization, trying to work, uh, work at the grassroots level and being an intervener on a docket uh, of this magnitude, they, they can be two different things. So I really don't know, Jay. I guess that's my answer. Yeah. And then, you know, the thing is, they would have to distinguish how their um, interest is different from um, the consumer advocate representing yeah, um, the right. consumer from Molokai. Right, yeah. right, right. Well, you know, you guys, uh, this has been a great discussion, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all the points on the agenda we wanted to talk about. Uh, we should next time talk about the PUC approval of a couple of things, including the modification, the grid modification plans and the demand response program, and maybe other things that come up in the meantime. The PUC has been approving Hawaiian Electric's uh, proposals here, and that's really notable. So uh, why don't we plan to talk about that and anything else that comes up in the meantime, including articles in the local publications and on mainland about energy in Hawaii. Uh, thank you, Mina Morita. Thank you, Marco Mangosdorf. It's always great to have these discussions. You guys rock. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much for having Marco. me.